that is our signal to get started. Sorry for the delay. The uh, internet was very, very slow this morning in accepting the uh, Zoom for our, our recording. So welcome. It's good to see you here today. So um, we're getting closer to our anniversary. Are you getting more excited? Yeah, yeah, next week. Oh, great, okay. Uh, Bob, if you want to advance that for me for the announcements. So the men's ministry, we're uh, meeting still on Wednesday mornings at 9.30 in person and by Zoom. Okay, next one. The vision days, the first one is this Thursday. So the elders are uh, meeting with Sandy, our, uh, our interim moderator. And, uh, but all of you are invited to come on Thursday morning from 9.30 until noon. And it's to pack your bags so that the, for it's a trip into the future so you can help discern God's destination for St. Paul's. So all voices are needed to be able to develop and to hear what God is saying to us. So next one. Next event will be the anniversary and where uh, things are starting. Like I uh, noticed that Allison's got some decorations up on the wall there and, and a picture with you, with you guys singing up there. And so you didn't see that, did you, Chris? <laughs> um, and then we have the, um, uh, the service with the, uh, with the St. Andrews Ancaster uh, band. We also have the uh, luncheon afterwards, and we've been talking with Susan from Metridges, and we've got some decorations getting organized, and so it's going to be a, a real event. So um, next one, please. The flooring project, we're up to $5,500, or over 50% of our goal. Yes, Ron. I heard some uh, emails and so on uh, yesterday. Yeah. 6,300. 6,300. So, hey. So, so, so that actually, whoops, watch. So that would actually bring us probably down to around here somewhere. So only that much more to go. <laughs> okay, uh, next. Uh, so the uh, uh, flooring colors will be the gray plank flooring. And some people have asked, well, what about the baseboard? What is that going to be? Well, it's going to be a gray vinyl that matches the floor. So everything will be the same, roughly the same size as what the carpeted piece is. And then the carpet part is the part that goes up here on these risers to replace those. So, and June 13th is now confirmed. So we will be having, so we talked last week about the possibility of writing some scripture verses on the floor. So if you have your favorite scripture verse and you wanna have it under the floor so that people can walk on God's word whenever they come in here, E email to me or tell me what it is, and then we'll get that organized so we can have them written across the floor. And if you have a favorite seat, we might even be able to put it under your seat. <laughs> okay, because um, I know where you all sit. <laughs> um, meal tickets are still 10 left. So if you haven't got yours yet, you can uh, talk to Ron after the service. Uh, it's it's a really good deal. Sorry, Bob. Go back to 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 to, to the meal for one, please. Um, the uh, yeah. yeah. You won't won't go back. Never. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, uh, through my brother, he's uh, he's an operations manager for twelve restaurants down in the Niagara area. Plus, he has a consulting business for. Um, uh, for, for, for restaurants. And one of his clients is a catering business up in Guelph. And uh, they have a commercial kitchen and they have a pastry chef that is part of their uh, uh, staff. And um, normally he would charge for this meal $28 plus 20% gratuity plus HST. And so uh, I didn't add that up, but he's giving it all to us for $18 a person. So we're charging 20 so we can help cover the cost for the guests and for if there's anybody who has difficulty in paying that we can help them out to do that. So we're getting a really good deal for, for this. So it's uh, where can you go anywhere 
in Canada now and get a meal this size for 20 bucks. So, okay, that's one. Uh, Audrey and Bob have, have a silent auction on for their cottage. Now, this is not what it's going to look like in the fall, okay? But, uh, because, uh, but it is, uh, when did you say it was built, Bob, in 2018? Yeah, 2018. So if you go to the next one in the fall, that's what it's going to look like. So if you're interested, uh, the current bid is $1,500, and uh, we have an inside shot as the next one. And that's one of the inside shots that you saw looking out onto the, onto the lake. And so there's only five weeks left. And uh, so if you want to get your bid in, now is the time to do it. Okay, thanks. That's one, Bob. Our first song is uh, Come Christians Join to Sing. And would you please stand and sing along with the St. Andrew's Ancaster Worship Band? <laughs> Respond with the uh, darker print, and that'll start on the second slide. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Come into his house with sacrifices of praise and worship. Sing to the glory of his name, for he has refined us like silver, led us through the fire and flood, and brought us out into freedom. And let's worship God together. Let us pray. Source of all creation, maker of the world and everything in it, you are never far from each of us. We come into your house seeking you, O giver of life and breath through your spirit. Reveal yourself to us, dwell with us, and abide in us. We live because of you. We hope because of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, in whom we live, and the spirit of truth who abides in us. Amen. And now, would you please say these words of confession with me? Maker and giver of all, forgive us when we are too preoccupied to notice your presence in our lives. When we walk 
through this world and fail to see the wonder of you upholding our lives and all creation. When we walk through our lives and fail to see you abiding with, within and around us. When we walk through holy moments and fail to savor your presence, instead feeling abandoned in the vast sweep of life as each day rushes at us with its demands. Open our eyes to your presence, God of love, that we may lean on you, for you uphold all of creation in tenderness and power. Amen. When Jesus left the disciples, he gave us a promise. I will not leave you orphaned. For we, his disciples, live in him and he in us. The presence of God within and around all, what a promise. Take courage, take comfort. Blessed be God. Amen. Well, uh, the big God project is going to be slightly different today. What we have is um, the, we're not going to show the video because I found a mistake in the video. And so I've talked with them and they said, oh yeah, we should have realized that. So we're going to make up a new one, but it won't be available until next fall. So, uh, so uh, I'm going to read the scripture afterwards. So, but we'll do our game. And this is the same one before and after and talking about transformation. And it reminds us that God transforms us from a before to an after. So that's one, Bob. <laughs> That's good. Okay, first one. Which one is the after? You have ore, you, could it be gold, could it be clay, or could it be butter? Gold? Okay, let's see. You're right. Okay, next one. Which one is the before? You have the ocean, you have the blue gummy sharks, salt, or uh, mouthwash? Hmm? Salt. salt? Do I hear salt? Let's see. Okay. Next one. Brazilian palm trees. Is it tar wax? Is it mustache wax? Or is it gummy bears? It could be all three. Tar wax? Are you going for tar wax? Well, let's see. It is all three. <laughs> okay, uh, which one is the before? Is it a crane, uh, a crane chest feathers, or is it pelican tail feathers, or is it goose left wing feathers? Not the right wing, but the left wing. Which one do you think makes up the Bab a Babington shuttlecock? So we have a pelican. Do you have any other choices? Nay. Nee. What is it, Bob? Let's see. It is the left wing goose feathers. Because the right wings cause the shuttlecock to go that way, where the left wings keep it straight. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, okay, sacrum officio. Or of cinearium, in other words, cane sugar. Cotton candy, pop, or marshmallows? Mm -hmm. Remember, it's cane sugar. Marshmallow? Which one is it? All three. So they got us twice this week with, with all threes. So uh, this, is, this is the last week for, for, for this game. Next week is called puns. And so it's how you, and uh, for the anniversary, I'm not sure that it would actually fit with that. So I don't think we'll have the game next week, but so. Okay, next one, Bob. So it opens up our theme to me. Holy Spirit re 
fines. Okay, and for our, what is something that gets better over time? Well, the first thing that I thought was wine, but you know, it's, uh, but you can get some very good Beaujolais, which is, you know, uh, uh, eh? <laughs> so um, one of the things that I thought that gets better with time is, this one, Bob? Next day leftovers. Uh, it's, it, is, it, is, it is not that, um, that a stew or a spaghetti sauce is bad on the first day, but when it sits overnight, it seems to mingle the flavors better, doesn't it? And so over time, now not too much time, but over a little bit of time, it gets better. Now, anything else? <laughs> Well, what about our faith? Does our faith get better with the, over, over time? Does, uh, is it an instant transformation you go from having nothing to having the best faith in the world? Or is it something gradual that works through the years? Right? Through your various experiences of, of seeing, in hindsight sometimes, the way God has worked in your life when you didn't even notice it at the time but later on you do, and that just grows your faith a little bit more. So, um, anything else? Perennial flower garden. A perennial flower garden, it just seems to grow and grow and grow. And that's, that's just like our faith, right? Just because keeps on, it's always there. It keeps on coming back and coming back. That's an excellent example, thank you. So, um, so uh, our next song is going to be, we haven't done this for, for over two years now, I think. It's called Breathe. And it's about our desire of uh, having God grow our faith in us all the time. Next one, Bob? Yeah, Breathe. Breathe remain seated. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is
So the, um, uh, the refining process that the Holy Spirit uh, does with us is that it's that part over time where it transforms us in our faith even deeper and deeper. But it's also something that we have to say to allow it to happen. And so that's part of what that song re- reflects to us, is saying that um, your presence is within me. And because I'm desperate for you, I give you permission to refine me and to transform me into being something that you wish for me to be the best that we can be. So um, our uh, passage today is uh, coming from Acts chapter 17, verse 16, to verse 18, verse 11. And it's part of Paul's uh, missionary, one of his missionary journeys. And uh, so um, hear the word of God. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does the babbler want to say? And others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we'd like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing of something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship. I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he gives himself to all mortals' life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and boundaries of the places they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he did not, was not far from each one of us, For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed. But others said, we will hear you again about this. And at that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysus and Apergite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word. 
testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to him, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius, Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue, and Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord, together with all of his household, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, for there are many in this city who are my people. He stayed there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Thanks be to God for this reading from his word. So what does this have to do with um, refining? Oh, that's one, Bob. My remote wasn't working last week, so I'm going to get you to move it. Uh, so, um, so we're talking about refining. And so... Um, this, this passage, Paul was being refined in a specific way. And when we look at what happened to him, we can start recognizing how God works with us. But first of all, let's sing another song, Refiner's Fire. Please remain seated. One thing to remember about that when it says, I choose to be holy, what you're actually saying is, I choose to allow you to make me holy. I give you permission to refine me. I give you permission to transform me. So um, what we're going to f f find out that the Holy first Spirit first refines us and then refines the mission that we have. Now, um, if you were given a job to do with no training, would you be able to do it? 
if you were given an objective to go and meet, but you had no information on how to do it. Now, I remember when I was a student with this congregation back in 1988 for the summer in the old building, and there was all these new homes going up, and I was uh, hired by the presbytery for the summer to work with St. Paul's and with Heritage Green to go and knock on doors and invite people to come to church. They gave me no training. Here I am, a new student, uh, relatively new in faith, because I had this knowledge, but I didn't have, I had moved it to my heart until 1985. So here I am, relatively new, and I went out and knocked on doors and invited people, and people were nice and polite. Did anybody come to church? One person in Heritage Green did, because I was never given the proper information. I was never refined. I was never uh, given what I needed to do that job. So the Holy Spirit first refines us, and then he refines the mission so that we can go out and do it. So, Bob, would you just bring up the next blank one for me? Thank you. So, um, so what does this have to do with Paul? Paul was the missionary to the Gentiles, right? That's one of his names. But did you notice where he went first in Athens and then in Corinth? He went to the Jews. If you go and look in the previous chapters, Paul always went to the synagogue first. So, so there's a disconnect here. How can he be the uh, missionary to the Gentiles when he's always trying to convert the Jews? Well, remember last week we talked about how the Holy Spirit opens and closes doors? Well, what uh, the refining process for Paul was to get him to stop going to the synagogues and to go to where his mission would be. Now, how long do you think that refining process took? Any idea? Well, let me give you a, 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 a bit of um, Paul's life timeline. He was born in 6 AD as a Roman citizen to Jewish parents in Tarsus, which is uh, the modern Eastern Turkey area. At the age of 14, he went for 10 years to study Torah in Jerusalem with uh, Gamiel, which is one of the famous rabbis of the time, and he became a Pharisee. At the age of 24, he persecutes the followers of Jesus in Nazareth. And remember when we talked about the stoning of Stephen? That was one of the things that was in 30 to 33 AD. And then he had his conversion in roughly 33 to 34 AD on, on the road to Damascus. So that's when he had that faith transformed from what he understood as being Jewish law and everything into being a follower of Christ. Um, in AD 36, he flees Damascus because of persecution. And from 36 to 44, for eight years, he preaches in Tarsus in his hometown. In 44 to 46, he was invited by Barnabas to teach in Antioch. Then in uh, AD 46, he goes uh, with Barnabas and he visits Jerusalem to bring a famine relief offering. It wasn't until 47 to 48, so when he was 41 to 42 years old, that he actually went on his first missionary journey. But in each of those missionary journeys, he always went to the Jewish synagogue first before he, before he, he, he did the Gentiles or the, or the Greeks. Uh, but something was starting to happen within him, because in AD 49, when he was 43 years old, he went to the Council of Jerusalem and he successfully argued that Gentile Christians need not to follow the Jewish law. In other words, men did not have to be circumcised in order to be a follower of Christ. So now, you know, so his, his, his conversion was in AD 33, and this is 49. So now this is 16 years later. 
that he's finally getting an inkling that he has to be doing something more for the Gentiles. He, uh, often when you read Paul, you think, well, wrote to the masters, three days later, the scales are done, next day he's off preaching and everybody's listening. He's only starting to get an inkling of what his true mission is 16 years later. So in AD 49 to 52, they go on the second missionary tour with Silas throughout Asia Minor and Greece. And he's in Athens. And he goes and he speaks to the uh, people who are there. Now, what is significant about this Athens part is, is that he has got another inkling of how God wants him to work, which doors are closed and which ones are open. He went to the Jewish synagogue and they basically threw him out. Then he goes to the, to the Europagus, and Bob, if you could put up the next slide for me. This is the Europagus. It's this hill. And if you look at the next one, Bob, it is actually looking up to the Acropolis where the Parthenon is up at the top. So that white spot down, down below, that's where, that, now in around 500 BC, that was the spot where the court, the, the justice court was for Greece. And so everything that was tried was done in, in the Europagus. Now, for some reason, it is named that after the uh, god Ares, which was the god of war. And the Romans called this Mars Hill after their god of war, which is Mars. Nobody can understand why a court of justice is, named, is placed on a place where the actual, where the god of war was. But um, one suggestion is, is that the um, uh, god of war was killed and the person who killed, the God who killed him was also killed on that spot. So justice was served, but that's just pushing it, right? So um, the reason why I'm, 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 I'm the, the telling you this, this background is it's because it goes into Paul's psyche and why he was doing things. The Peloponnesian War happens in 400 BC. And after that, this place becomes the court for just for murder trials. And then after that, as, as we get a little farther along, the, the court is moved up to the, uh, the Acropolis on the top. And what this place becomes is a gathering place for people to debate. So it used to have seats and everything. There was little houses on the top, but over time people have stolen the pieces. So now it's just a, just a flat rock with some carved stones leading up to the top. But um, uh, so Stoics and Epicureans. Stoics are people who, um, uh, who, who their guiding principle is, is um, um, it's a foundational part of, of their life. So it, if you're a Stoic, whatever morals and whatever values you have are the things that mean the most for you. But if you're an Epicurean, and an and Epicurean it talks about pleasure as being the uh, thing of life, that you should be uh, guiding your life by whatever brings you pleasure. Um, so, so you have these Epicureans and you have these Stoics debating day in, day out, any new idea that comes up to see if they can make it part of their side. Paul goes in there, he's invited there to talk with them about this new idea, and he reaches the Stoics and the Epicureans with an argument about God, about the unknown God. What he does for them is, is that he transcends all of their human arguments with an argument of God that fills, fills both sides and tells them what they need to do in order to grow in that. That must have given Paul an idea that the door was closed to the Jews in the synagogue, 
but here it is wide open to the Gentiles. And he was smart enough and, and of a, not so much a philosopher of himself, but a, but a speaker that was able to reach both sides and people responded. So now when he moves from Athens up into Corinth and he tries again going into the synagogue and they're really not, that he sort of like goes and slanders them and says, I'm not gonna deal with you anymore. I'm gonna to go to the Gentiles only. And the beginning of his mission is now from Corinth on. But he had to be refined. He had to get, now, how many years was that from the time of his conversion to the time he reaches Corinth? Eight to 18 eight years, actually. 18 years. Now, if any of you have ever thought, why is God taking so much time in doing what he's supposed to do with me? Aren't, aren't I supposed to be doing something faster than this? Aren't I supposed to be you know, ready and doing? And, and how much time has he taken so far to refine you so that you are ready for that mission? See, it doesn't matter what, um, what age you are. It matters how have you allowed God to refine you and what is God refining you for? And whatever age that comes about, then it's the right age because that's what God's plan is. And what's God's will? To reach everyone. What is God's plan? To use us to help in that mission. So if we go and look at... Um, uh, um, um, Paul was Paul was martyred in AD 64. Remember, this is now 52 to 59, so it's only five years of his mission. So God missed out on 18 years of doing stuff with him. No, God was working with him and doing stuff through him to get him to that point where those five years were so important. Because in uh, Corinth, he, he reached the Ephesus, the, the Ephesians. He wrote to the Philippians. He wrote to, to the Thessalonians. He wrote to the Romans. And in that five years, we have a big chunk of the New Testament. Because Paul had been refined and he was ready to do his mission. God is always working on us to refine us. So Bob, if you could move that next one. And um, Andrew uh, Petropin wrote uh, what would be a modern day um, Paul speaking to us about the, um, what, what we are facing. And because this was so, so important in Paul's development, as a missionary to the Gentiles, maybe it can be important for us to hear how it might be effective today. Women and men of Canada, I see that you care about a lot of stuff. And like me, you care mostly about you. In fact, you are fiercely individualistic and want no talk of being anything but you. In fact, if you don't like what you've got, there are many places to turn for improvement. What's driving? As it happens, your largely unconscious impulse to be infinitely important is not such a bad thing. And unfortunately, however, you will not achieve your desired end, so far as there is an end, by any of the means you have been exposed to. State-sponsored justice is good and noble thing, but it does not create gods. No amount of money or surgery will either. If you think yourself as, as a god, none of these things are going to work. Like your great writer Tolkien described by means of rings and orcs, self-actualization ends only in turning its pursuant into a twisted wreck. When you try to do things all by yourself, you end up 
falling down. Desiring divinity is the right track to be on. And desiring to be the best version of you intersects with it. But the fulfillment of these desires is God's gift, not humanity's right. What if I told you that the one God and Father of all wanted you to be the real and best version of you? Now he's talking to the Epicureans. And what if I told you that the only way to be you was to be like him? And what if I told you that it was your destiny to be fit, composed, at home in your own skin, at peace in your own soul, impervious to pain and illness, and knowledgeable of every knowledgeable thing? Finally, what if I told you that this optimized version of you was destined to hang out with a comparably wonderful version of me? And what would that take, and that would, and that we would take our places in a perfectly ordained society with no racial hatred, no economic inequality, and no traffic jams. As it turns out, this is the Christian view of eternity, a new heaven and a new earth, a new me and a new you. And your present desires are only just missing the mark. That's what Paul would say to us today. That all these things that we have going around, swirling around us, are mostly human made. They're mostly human ideas. But if you really want to be the best you can be, then be the one that God's refining you into. Be the one that God is setting up you up for, for your own mission in his plan. Remember John Ortberg and that thing that I've said a couple of times, the me I want to be is the one that God wants me to be. And when I'm the one that God wants me to be, I'll be the me that I want to be. Right? unless we have the Holy Spirit refining us, then we'll never be everything that God made us to be. And if you want that, you have to say, yes, Lord, allow this to happen in me. Refine me. Transform me. There's a uh, the prayer that I, that I found that I think says this. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are our God and our Savior. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. For in you, we live and move and have our being. Use our lives to glorify you. And thank you, Father, for sending the Lord Jesus to suffer and die so that we might live. Amen. Our next is Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Please remain seated as we sing along.
As with our uh, offering, the uh, plates are at the door if you, if you need to use them. And uh, we seek uh, to be generous as God has been so generous with us. Let us pray. Holy One, you transformed the life of Saul. He was converted to your work as a disciple. We too have been transformed by your love. You earnestly listen for our daily response to your steadfast presence. <clears throat> Open our hearts so that we may walk consciously with you each day. We lift up this offering in obedience to your will. In the name of the risen Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Are there any people on your hearts or, or situations today that need to be brought up in prayer? Yes. You're doing for certain? Okay. Okay, uh, Barb is going for surgery for two areas on her face at St. Joseph's in Toronto. So may you have traveling mercies in the traffic of Toronto as you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you might have to leave around four. <laughs> Um, uh, I know where that hospital is because I've been in there a, 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 a number of times. You can see it from the QEW, but you can't get to it from the QEW. So, yeah, so you'll be, you're, not, not the QEW, it's called the Gardner Expressway. Yeah. How soon you forget. Right? So, anything else? Yes, sir. Harriet and Mm-hmm. Harriet and Catherine, Elizabeth and John. Now, um, I tried phoning Harriet to see how things went. Did Catherine make it up here? Yes, she did. Okay. This, um, I, I, uh, when we tried calling yesterday, we, we didn't get a call. And uh, so Catherine's setting, and that's Harriet's sister who was living in PEI. And so, um, and, uh, the, um, and I was talking with, uh, Elizabeth this this week and she's getting confusing messages about what palliative care means and 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 everything so we've been doing some some research but John's not at the point where he needs uh, um, that hospice type of uh, placement but he is in the palliative care um, schedule so he's at that point and um, People are telling her, oh, it could be a year, it could be next week, and who, and and we don't know. So what we have to do is lift Elizabeth and John that they can practice their faith day by day and know that God's timing is always right. Anything else? Well, we have our uh, prayer wall, and and we haven't had had a had a prayer mail go out for a while because there hasn't we've we've. We have had some some requests, but uh, it seems that that a lot of people seem to be okay. Should I say that out loud? Well, I'm I'm not superstitious, so I can say it out loud. It just seems that that we're doing okay, right? God is at work in us. Amen. He's refining us. Amen. He is using us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, um, thank you, thank you, thank you for, uh, for all, all that you are constantly doing within our lives. And even if we think that you're taking too much time or it's just taking way too long, we just have to think of the Apostle Paul and the 18 years in refining to get him to the point of those five years of missionary to the Gentiles. Everyone's different. Some might be a couple of years, some might be three or four decades, but we all have a part in your plan that all would come to salvation. Because that is your will. And you are not going to stop being faithful in guiding us and leading us. 
but Lord, just as we, um, as we seek to be refined, we know we have to give you permission because you will not force us. You will not um, do anything that would cause us to stumble. But in all ways, you would open the doors and you would close the doors so that uh, we would be able to see and we would give you permission to keep on working in our lives. That's the area that refining that allows our prayers to be more in tune with you. And so when we lift up specific people, whether it's for operations or whether it's waiting for tests or, or if it's uh, just wondering about what might be happening with loved ones in, in all these things, our prayers become more intimate with you as you refine us deeper and deeper. So we are thankful for your refining process. We are thankful, Holy Spirit, for working from the inside out. And we're thankful that as more people see us, they see Jesus in us. And may it be our goal that they will just see Jesus in the end. And that way we will know that we are holy. We're in a holy family. We are uh, part of your plan, part of your will, part of your love and grace and mercy for this world. For, for those who are feeling anxious about this COVID and, and, uh, and uh, what is happening, we see opening up through, throughout the world and, uh, and we wonder. May we look at what you're telling us. May we respond to the truth of what you say, Holy Spirit, into us and around us. May we discern what is right and what is wrong, what is closed and what is open and, and respond accordingly. Lord, we also want, want to pray for these vision days that are coming up, that, um, that the messages that you give through your people will show us the pathway, how you have been refining St. Paul's for its next step in your plan. And you will reveal that to us. So allow us to have the courage to speak up and say what we feel you are saying to all of us. Thank you, Jesus, for being who you are, our Lord, our Savior, our God. And as your disciples asked, you gave them specific words in which to pray. And so can we say them together now? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. See, we're all not perfect. Our, our closing song is All the Way My Savior Leads Me, and this is one of these ones where there's no voice leading it, so we're going to have to do the leading ourselves. So uh, if you would stand and we'll sing All the Way My Savior Leads Me. <laughs> 